Come along, children. Now we're going to have a little music. What's up, guys? I'm Ace. This is RB3. And this is First Cut, here to discuss a little bit more about Martin Scorsese. I know this is a controversial topic all over film Twitter, and people already give their opinions about it. I have been open in saying that I feel like this was a little bit blown out of proportion, if I'm being honest. But since Martin Scorsese got a lot of feedback regarding his comments to Empire Magazine, he released, he actually wrote an op-ed for the New York Times, an opinion piece trying to clarify his position on the comment of Marvel movies aren't cinema quote that he gave to Empire Magazine. And I wanted to discuss it with you, RB3, because I feel like this is a very interesting opinion piece that he wrote, considering he actually wrote this. This isn't some reporter reporting it. This is his, this is Martin Scorsese straight up telling you, the audience, the member, the reader, what his opinions are and how he feels about certain things in an actual article. This isn't some sort of, you know, Q&A. This is him straight up saying it. Mm -hmm. um, I want to get your reactions to this, and especially the piece, because I feel like the comments were whatever, but the piece itself, what do you what do you think of this piece written by Martin Scorsese? Um, listen, I mean, I think what he's saying in this piece is what I've kind of interpreted. I think what most smart people have interpreted about his comments the entire time. He's not talking about just Marvel movies. Oh, I, are you offended by what I just said? No, no, no. Okay. I, I'm going to come back okay. at you, okay. well, man. I'm That's saying, all I'm saying. Well, I think most, most slower people think he's directly addressing, oh, I hate Marvel movies because they're Marvel. No, he's never. He's not saying that. He's never said that. Anybody who kn knows what Martin Scorsese and is familiar with his taste knows what he's referring to is blockbuster, blockbuster cinema, um, and blockbusters, franchises, things of little risk. That's really what he's he's attacking here. And listen, Marvel movies are great. They're easy to consume. They're fun. I love them. Um, but I think what Martin Scorsese is is going is trying to emphasize here is that he comes from an era where there was a promotion of the art tour, where there was the artist, the singular artist who had a vision, who took risk, who studios took risk on the individuals, not other properties. So um, this is something he harkens back to. He names particular directors in this that I think are really interesting. He says films from Paul Thomas Anderson or uh, Claire Dennis or Spike Lee or Ari Aster or Captain Bigelow or Wes Anderson. He, You go into those movies not expecting a certain thing but with marvel movies you go in expecting a certain thing so that's what his the heart of his comments was really coming from interesting it, but mean, not just marvel movies franchise blockbusters in general yeah I, I think he's going after franchises in general i agree with that point initially however i feel like he reaches his main point towards the end of the article but before i get to that i, I kind of want to full disclosure on this entire opinion piece and if you haven't read it i highly recommend you read this uh, because it's a little bit more nuanced than just a quote. I feel like an entire article can give you so much more. And I disagree with some of this, if I'm being completely honest. But on his main point, I agree with RB3. And the reason why is because he reaches his main point towards the end of the article when he talks about, you know, what's my issue? Why not just let superhero movies be superhero movies? And he says... The franchise film is the only thing you see on the big screen. The opportunity, and this is something that I've been telling you, RB3, for years, the opportunity for smaller movies, for other versions of cinema to be seen on the big screen is limited to none. It's almost zero to none. It, it, the vast majority of theater chains choose the movie that's going to be most profitable to them. And the movie that's most profitable to them profitable to them is this MCU Marvel type product and that's why all the screens are usually filled up by those movies and less and less screens are filled up with smaller movies or movies that aren't franchises and movies like Ari Aster's Midsommar or movies like A Parasite or movies that are great movies that people need to see this year that they don't get the chance to see in theaters because most of the theater chains are selling out these screens and they have limited windows to be able to see these movies. Um, he says it towards the end of the article. He says, yes, I believe every filmmaker wants their films to be seen on the big screen. 
and to be projected before audiences on the big screen. And then he says, oh, I know what you're going to say. I just made a movie with Netflix. And he says, I just made the movie where they offered me the biggest opportunity to make the movie. Basically, he's just saying they offered me more money to make this movie with Netflix. And I needed that money to make The Irishman exactly how I wanted to make it. And they let me do it exactly how I wanted to. And he says, I do have a theatrical window. People can see it in the big screen. It's smaller. Yeah, than, I saw it in the big, on the big screen. There you go. It's yeah. smaller than most movies in the sense of like you don't have that many opportunities to see it on the big screen. But I still wanted it to be seen on the big screen. My point is I think what he's trying to say is that we're headed down a road in film, in cinema, where instead of seeing movies in a diverse version of movies, we're only going to see one type of movie, and that's the blockbuster movie in theaters. Whereas all the other movies, he says, are going straight to streaming. Yeah, and I mean, that's I a don't, disappointment. And yeah, I agree, I, that is a disappointment. I don't. I, okay, so let's. There's, there's a lot. There's a lot to address here. Okay, so for n- number one, let's put the streaming thing aside. Let's talk about. Let's have a general conversation. But he said about, it. Well, let's, well, hold up. Let's, let's have a general conversation about cinema. Okay, cinema. The 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 cycle that evolves in cinema. Every thirty years, there's always going to be. We're always going to repeat the same patterns. We always go through a blockbuster-ish type era. You know, that that happened in the 1950s when the the height of the Hollywood motion pictures. At 1920s, okay, let's break it down. When I say 30 years, it's breaking down into exactly how 30 years relates, right? 1920s, the the height of the silent era. 1950s, the height of the Hollywood classical era. And the beginning of the decline of it. 1980s, uh, the the. Action height movie. of the action movies of the blockbusters that was created by Martin Scorsese's friends Steven Spielberg and George Lucas with Jaws and Star Wars. Um, so, the, but then you see when you have when you look at the immediate decades following, you look at something like the '90s. The '90s is when we saw a huge revelation and. Uh, and, and filmmakers, especially the filmmakers that he listed before, like I said, Spike Lee, Paul Thomas Anderson, all came out in the 90s. Quentin Tarantino came out in the 90s. They support a lot of the auteur theories. The same thing happened in the 1960s. After the Hollywood system breaks apart, we start to see a whole new league of voices. So that is something that's always going to happen in Hollywood. There's always going to be a transitional period. Um, right now, we're in that transitional period. So he's you, he's using Marvel and franchise as as a, a, a as a finger to push because they are successful right now but as i'm sure as Mark Scorsese and Mark Scorsese most definitely knows this because he is such a um, adamant follower of cinema he knows that this whole thing is going to fall apart he's just really he's getting ahead of the he's getting ahead of the curve essentially with this kind of article because he knows eventually marvel move eventually listen every, everybody says the marvel bubble is going to crash or whatever i don't necessarily say that but there is going to be a point where Marvel films and superhero films are not the most popular genre. There is going to be that point eventually. Um, and once we get to that point, um, we are going to see um, a lot more expressiveness um, from young filmmakers who are um, beginning to grow and and and, and uh, display their visions in different ways. Um, now, when it comes to streaming— I don't know if that's the case, if I'm being honest. It's, it's going to be the case. I just because, don't know. Listen, because here's why. Let me, let me tell you why. 1999 was the year that— um, the Matrix came out. Mm-hmm. Paul Thomas Anderson's Magnolia came out. Um, literally, I could go through a plethora of the yeah. most insane Spike movies. Jones's movie Spike came Jones, out. being being John Malkovich, came out. Mm-hmm. That was the the year of that. A lot of people consider that. I mean, there's been entire books written about mm-hmm. this now. Of that year, I've read a whole being, article. Amy yeah. Nicholson wrote one. Yeah, it's yeah, great. yeah, exactly. And um, and but but that's an important year because a lot of people contribute that to the fact that the Phantom Menace was coming out. So all the other studios are just like, well, if this is the one franchise that's going to come out, let's just throw our money at all these little projects and see how they do. Um, so I think eventually we're going to get back to that point. Now, if that is going to happen on the big screen or on streaming, that's a different conversation. Um, but that's his do, whole argument. Yeah, but do I? But just because something is on streaming doesn't mean it's not uh, cinema. You know what I mean? And I he knows, agree. And, and he, that's and, not his point. Yeah, I know. And but he, his point is that. Eventually, independent movies and 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 smaller movies are going to be on streaming networks. And my counterpoint is, there's nothing wrong with that. That's not bad. I know. It's, I know we. I know we as cinephiles. Well, you're disagreeing with his main point, then. Yeah, I did. Well, I not his. I don't think that's his, it main, is point. his main point. No, I Literally think literally at the end of the article, he says, "You might argue, can't they just go home and watch anything else they want on Netflix, iTunes, or Hulu?" And he says, "Sure, but it's anywhere." But the big screen, where I, the filmmaker intended his or her picture to be seen. 
That's yeah. how he ends the no, I don't No, that's not the end of the article. The article literally ends, and this is why I think his main point is artistry. The article ends with, for anyone who dreams of making movies or trying to start out, the situation... Uh, the situation at this moment is brutal and hostile to art, and the act of simply writing those words filled me with terrible sadness. So I think his overall point is to say that because studios are less likely to take risks because they're banking on so many franchises, there is going to be a death to the auteur. There is going to be a death to the individual yeah, there's artist. Two, I think so, that's, well, that's one of his points, and the, he, he gives credence to his point early in the article when he, tar- he starts to talk about the line between art and and product and he says i'm not saying mine isn't a product it is but but what is is it more a product or is it more a film and that's the the problem with the mcu movies is that it's hard to say which one is more if i asked you is is our mcu movies more of a product or more of a film how would you answer that question product exactly and that's his problem his problem is that they could be good movies and all, but they're much more of a product. They have much more hands on them. They're they're you know developed in in, in test rooms and, and and tested out with audiences. Yeah, exactly. They have ten he, he's comparing different it to, people rewriting it. They have like twenty it, writers. And you know what? And that's a, that's the exact time period that we were in the fifties too, with the factory filmmaking that was the classical period. Sure. And that's the same thing we were in the eighties. And that's just, and listen again. I made this point on uh, C uh, C E. N this morning and um, C E N yeah yeah S E N S C N okay S C N I'm God trying to help damn. you man it's been a long day I'm man. helping you um this this is this is the, I think this is probably one of the most crucial points you got to know the era that Martin Scorsese comes from Martin Scorsese comes from the late sixties early seventies that's when films had to be political that's when films had to say something you can't you, when the political climate is Nixon Vietnam. Um, you know, Watergate, all of these intense, intense scandals, um, you know, and, and the Hollywood circle, uh, the Manson murders, things were just becoming really, really dark during that time period. And cinema had to reflect that. And in doing that, they, in, in doing that, studios recruited these young voices to sweep up and, and figure out what to do. Um, so I think, and again, that happens, that will always constantly happen as a cycle in Hollywood. We just haven't hit that cycle yet, but we're about to, I think. And that, I think that's what's important. I think that's why him giving shout outs to people like Ari Aster is a good sign of what we're going going for. Yeah, but I still feel like you're you're looking at one point in his article and ignoring his my point, what I'm trying to well, say. Okay, I don't, which is like four paragraphs where he literally says, This is a quote. The equation has flipped, and now streaming has become the primary delivery system. Still, I don't know a single filmmaker who doesn't design their films to be seen on the bricks on the big screen to be projected before audience in theaters and he's yeah. saying they're not giving these smaller movies opportunities to be seen before audiences in theaters he's talking about theater chains he's talking about how mcu products are seen like you have if i'm a theater company i have to invest towards this versus investing in an Ari Aster or a Midsommar. I'm telling you, man, like there are theaters in the middle of the country in America right. that probably won't show Midsommar or Parasite or any of these movies that you and I have been seeing these past few weeks, Jojo mm-hmm. Rabbit, whatever mm-hmm. it is, mm-hmm. because of these bigger movies that are coming out. And what he's saying is every filmmaker I know wants to have that chance to be seen on the big screen. Yeah, and I agree course. with that. Yeah. I, I feel... I go back to the quote by Jason Blum when he gave it to the New York Times earlier this year. He gave a quote saying, Whiplash, if it comes out now, it's coming out on Hulu. It's coming yeah. out on Netflix. It's not going to be seen in theaters. Yeah. And to me, that's disappointing because seeing those movies in theaters, me personally, right? And I can talk to this about anybody, made me choose those movies to be my favorite movies, made me want to buy them on Blue Man, made me want to share it with other people. Would I have that same reaction if I saw it on my laptop? I do not know because I do feel like the theater experience, the, the audience gives the movie some sort of allure. It gives it a different light. You feel the movie's message, branding, whatever it's trying to say differently when you're in a group of people. That's never that's always going to be the case yeah and and you might not get that chance because mcu yes but it's the product that's but here's here's the thing here's the thing and and you know we always go back and forth with this and we're always going to make this i'm always going to make the same point listen if you're not getting a theater at least more people are getting to see it at least people are going to see the irishman more people are going to see the irishman than probably any other martin scorsese movie ever that's yeah. a fact. Maybe Wolf of Wall Street has, you know, Wolf of Wall Street made $400 million. Departed made a lot of money too. But the fact of the matter is, 
Netflix is going to be pushing this movie in front of people's faces, same way they did with Roma. Who would have anticipated Netflix's marketing budget? But who would have anticipated a movie like Roma, a Spanish foreign language movie, being nominated for twelve Oscars and having the opportunity to to have that story be told? If it wasn't, and listen, I the reason why I don't really he he is he is saying yeah, like the multiplex is where cinema lives, and that is that is. A reflection of where cinema has grown. We 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 did grow cinema from that organically. Um, but to me, it's like cinema evolves, and he recognizes that it's evolving. He's one of the few directors who both shot on 3D. One of the few directors of his era, particularly of, of the Spielberg, the Lucas, and all of that. He shot he shot Hugo on 3D. He shot Wolf of Wall Street on digital. He shot. Um, He's doing this Irishman on Netflix. I think he's one of the directors who has always maintained he's being adapting. ahead of the curve. Yeah, yeah. and he's adapting. Um, but I think that, but and, and and I do think that while we are going to see, uh, we, while we are seeing more of these middle budget, um, more character driven movies on streaming platforms, I think that's I think at least that gives people who are who do have to drive to you know, who aren't in Los Angeles and who aren't in New York and who have to drive two or three hours to see uh, one of the most highly anticipated movies of the year. Um, I think the opp- the fact that they now have the opportunity to view that at home. And by the way, now that we have TVs and stereo systems that are better than ever, you get better image quality than ever. A lot mm-hmm. of times 4K TVs are projected at higher resolutions than most actual movie projectors because sure. movie projectors proje- project in 2K for the most part. Um, so the fact of the matter is you you, you might not have that same audience experience, mm-hmm. um, but you do have access to the to the cinema. And I think the more access to film, the better. I think what we're trying to get at, too, is, is you and I both disagree and agree with Martin Scorsese in certain points in this article. Yeah. I, I don't know if, do you agree with that statement? That yeah, there's, yeah, there's yeah. things that you see eye to eye and there's things that you don't. Yeah. I, for, for one, uh, don't see eye to eye with him when he starts to say that, you know, I, I grew up with movies that are about character and I grew up with movies about risk. And I, and I was like, mm, well, he did. He did. No, no, he did. But yeah. I'm saying, like, to say that Marvel movies doesn't focus on character at all, like, there, there's, there are certain Marvel movies that do. I, I feel like he's generalizing when it comes to that point in his article. Yeah, but I mean, damn, it's not like the the movies of the seventies. It's not like the sixties. Like, but they got say, deep into you the feel, woods of the characters. But you know what I, I can mean? counter with you by yeah. saying, do you feel like that? But that's still limitations there during their time with these opportunities that you have with different oppor- like technology and film are always going to be connected. I yeah. mean, obviously, I can you can make entire books and documentaries about this about the idea how technology always is going to influence film and this is since the beginning of film right right since the beginning of cameras and film and the ideas of going to theaters you know the conception of it will always go hand in hand with technology during the 70s you didn't have this kind of technology though so i i I can counter you by saying if the 70s had this kind of technology they'd be making marvel movies too because yeah. they would say, I can I do mean, story and I can do epic. I yeah. can do both. I can do Lawrence of Arabia on crack with, like, Avengers Endgame. Like, I can do both. A story of a character and I can make an epic. At the same time, it'll cost me less money. This, These are opportunities that technology provide filmmakers. And I feel like I don't, to but simply I don't know say— what that's, I don't know what that has to do with character, though. Like, what, what does that have to do with character? I'm saying they can do stuff. both. Yeah, you can but make I, an action I, spectacle listen, movie. I love black. That will make listen, you cry. Bro, bro, listen, no, 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 stop, It'll stop. Make me wait, cry. wait, 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 stop, stop, Have stop. Have you ever cried? Stop, 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 stop. I love Black Panther. I love that Oscar movie. Oscar nominated I love that Black movie. Panther. I love that movie. You're not going to tell me that any kind of character work in Black Panther is anything comparable to anything that you see in. Taxi driver, anything that you see, and like, but again, in, in, in anything, you're missing anything the point. that. What's your? I don't understand the point. The, the point, point is that there's is, more technology. No, the point is, if I'm making a movie like Black Panther, yeah. and I have the opportunity to make it a, a, an epic story that people can actually feel and thrall with, and I have the budget to do that, and I have the technology to do that, of course, it's not going to have the same character because there's certain there's limitations as far as runtime in a movie versus a movie as taxi driver which the entire movie you can focus on I, character i can't no no i if can't someone, get, i can't get behind rather having better cgi I, than better character no, i'm not work. saying I can't that. Get behind that i'm saying this if, if that's if that's if a priority of a movie then that shouldn't be a priority an extra, technology should never be a priority technology I've, should never be a priority i disagree i feel like if martin scorsese had an extra 200 million dollars for taxi driver and they said hey man 
you can throw in whatever action scene you want. And he had the opportunity to do whatever the hell he wanted. You bet your ass he's going to make some and dope he, ass scene. And he did have a dope ass scene at the end no, where, where they shoot out. Like, and guess what? And guess what happened? Martin Scorsese is literally, literally. You think he will bend for an uh, extra twenty million dollars for no, for, for taxes? Ben. I'm or, saying they just give it to him. No, because he's Martin Scorsese. But then, but then you're telling me, but you're they telling just me gave because it to they, but they gave, they, but they gave Coogler his money. But you think, yeah. you think, you think this was you? You honestly, okay. For example, I'm going to go back to Taxi Driver, right? Taxi Driver. We're talking about Martin Scorsese. Literally, the story in Hollywood is that um, they were they made him change. They were going to make him change the ending of Taxi Driver mm-hmm. um, because it was too violent. So the night before, one night he stood he stood up all night drinking with a pistol in his hand. He was going to go to Columbia and shoot one of the executives because he did not want to change the ending of Taxi Driver. You're telling yeah. me this guy. I'm what saying, you're telling me no, this no, no. guy. You don't get what, what I'm what, saying. What, 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 I'm, I'm saying if he worked with Kevin Feige. And yes. If Kevin Feige is the complete opposite. He's like, bro, do whatever ending you want. Here's 50 more mil. Dude, dude, if you want to do an action scene where it's extra violent, make it extra violent. Throw in some more blood. But, Here, here's more money for more blood. Uh, like he I, would, nah, nah, you, nah. You, don't no, think he, be, you think he'd say, no, nah, man, I don't know. He's not, that's not his type of movie. Listen, the, 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 the Irishman is a $200 million budget. There's no fucking blowing up explosion. There is explosions. $300 million. There, 300 million. It's it like has, 285. Yeah, bro. yeah. You listen, and, but you, the, of course there's explosions. Of course there's violence but there is why that budget is so big is because of technology yeah exactly but i think there's there's a difference between using technology right and using technology only for spectacle and i think what he's saying is that blockbusters and 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 franchises they're only using uh this this kind of technology they're only focusing on the avenues that technology because i think he even says at the end of the at the end of the article um there's there's worldwide audiovisual entertainment in their cinema. What he's saying is this is audiovisual entertainment. That's true. But cinema is supposed to be what from his interpretation. I don't maybe I don't even necessarily agree with this interpretation of cinema because I think cinema could reach a wide range and I think cinema can also be streaming. So I don't even particularly agree with with saying that, you know, that's the point. But the point that he's making is that just because there's good technology doesn't mean there's a good story. There's not a good story. And I love Marvel movies, and a lot of Marvel movies have a lot of great stories. But it doesn't weigh up to a lot of the stuff that we had in you. the past. I agree with you. I'm not disagreeing. Right, right, right. I'm simply saying, giving, giving, giving the, the every movie has barriers and boundaries, and you're put in some sort of, whether you're making a genre movie or, or an action movie or, or a classic or musical or, or, or whatever kind of movie you're making, you're giving these parameters. With Ryan Coogler, Ryan Coogler can make something as beautiful and as heartbreaking and as heart-wrenching as Fruitvale Station, as, as intense, as in-your-face, and as emotionally punching as Creed That's and as huge, powerful, epic, fun action movie as Black Panther. Yeah. Those three movies can live individually, and b- all three of them can can be just as impactful as the other. And I feel like simply saying, well, this isn't what it is because it's got cars flipping. No, and it's like, no, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm I know saying that's it, not what you're saying. Yeah, I'm yeah. saying comparing this movie to those is unfair because those aren't the same parameters. That's not what he was trying to do. In Fruitvale yeah. Station, he can still give you that. Of course. And in Black yeah. Panther, he can give you something else. That's yeah. called being a really good filmmaker. Yeah. And that's what Ryan Coogler of is. Yeah, and of course, no dig, no dig against Ryan Coogler. And, and I agree with the major points that Martin Scorsese is trying to say. He's trying to say now, like I said before, the line between product and film is getting blurred. And now there's so many hands, there's so many things involved to almost shake audiences up like he says in a theme park it's almost theme park because they want to like shake you up and throw you around and impress you and and wow you rather than emotionally move you through a character and i agree with that 100 percent yeah no i yeah i i i I agree with i think for me at least the thing that i take the most out of this whole article in his op-ed is the artistry aspect of it? Is the mm. fact that there is a depth to the artist now that there is a bunch of franchises that have to exist, and a lot of the corporations are running this this the studio system that kind of way. Um, again, I, I go, I'm going to go back to the political angle of it, but go go. Let's go back to the 1950s again. Let's go back to when that the. the the era that came before it, the wartime era, the 1940s, was a far more democratically leaning 
country, the United States was a far more democratically leaning country. Um, but then in 1946, with the 1946 election, a lot of the ideology started changing towards the public, towards towards the right, towards republicanism, mm-hmm. and that is when we started to see the factory filmmaking start to become like a mainstream idea, and we eventually see audiences get tired of that. Cut to the 1980s. That's often considered the most commercialized era in cinema because that's when we start to see the big conglomerates start to merge with each other. That's when we saw Coca-Cola, I think, buy Sony at the time or Columbia at the time. We saw a bunch of these gigantic mergers and these gigantic movies with gigantic budgets and making gigantic money in the 1980s. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why. And and during that time period, politically, too, we were in the Ronald Reagan era. We were in an era that was a lot more um, that that was not necessarily in congruence with the stuff that Scorsese uh, had, grew, had 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 come up with too. I agree. So this, so this is the time period we're to in me, now. To so me, to I, me, we're going to eventually evolve into the next into the next step where the artists are back on top. I, I I'm hopeful for that. And to me, I I, I consider Scorsese to be go. I mm-hmm. mean, for crying out loud, the guy's one of the greatest filmmakers ever. And everything you said is correct. And and he's the kind of guy who wants to push audiences to feel. Mm-hmm. Want, wants to create an artistry, an actual art, like he says. When people say art, they don't mean that in air quotes. They mean that literally, where you can compare actual paintings, actual musical pieces, just as much art as Martin Scorsese movies. And if that's going to be the case, there has to be some sort of artist with a paintbrush, meaning art tour theory, right? Mm-hmm. And there has to be a vision that's laid out and that's completed by the end of the film. And there's supposed to be a theme, a, a feel, a connection that he can deliver to an audience, the artist directly to the viewer, the reader, whatever it is that it, art can give, whether it's poetry or, or paintings. And that's to me, is his main point in this article. And I, dude, he, yeah, he's right. Yeah. Like, I think, yeah, we could both agree. We can both yeah. agree that he's kind of right. <laughs> yeah, and and, 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 and we'll, just to, just to close that out, I, I want to end with, with I want to end with I want to end with what I'm saying with with a quote uh, that he puts in the, in the article, uh, or when he's talking about the filmmaker, um, or in the films of Alfred Hitchcock. I was supposed that Hitchcock was his own franchise or that he was our franchise. Every new Hitchcock picture was an event. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is where I think he wants cinema to be. I think that's where I personally would like to see cinema go in a direction to and not necessarily – and again, when I'm talking about tour theory, I I should have said this earlier in the video – our tour theory is often associated with the idea of powerful white men. Mm. Uh, it's often identified with the idea of the male director having this ego. I'm not referring to it as that. I'm referring it to the general idea of an artist. An auteur can be a black man. It can also be a woman. It could be as many people. And I, I want more of that personally, too. I think Ava DuVernay is a perfect example of an auteur. But that being said, though, I think when you're talking about a movie a, 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 a filmmaker where his movies are events, I think that's always going to be um, where cinema should be. And I, I I like that. I like the fact that people get excited for a new Tarantino movie. I like the fact that people made a gigantic movement to see Jordan Peele's Get Out and Us. I like the fact that every time, um, I like the fact that every time, who's, who's another one that Nolan. comes out? Nolan, God, dude, Nolan. Nolan, exactly. When Nolan, Nolan is his own franchise. When, not, when Nolan drops, they literally mm-hmm. just have to put Nolan's name in the trailer yeah. and it's going to sell out well, seats. But what so. you're trying to say is that there, there's still that glimmer of hope. We still see yeah. that, man. Yeah, so let's exactly. hang on to that hope, guys. Hopefully you you enjoyed our debate and our conversation. Yeah. Uh, if you stuck around all the way through, let us know your it. thoughts. If you didn't stick around all the way through, then please don't say anything because <laughs> you already pre- pre- have your predisposed uh, opinions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but either way, guys, let us know in the comments down below. What do you think? Uh, and for that conversation, for First Cut, make sure you tune around and see some other reviews or see our podcast. We have other things going on, so make sure you stay tuned on this channel. All right, guys, we're peacing out. I am Ace. This is RB3. And we're peacing out. Let's go. Let's go.